Hey everyone, thanks for joining me tonight on the live stream. I know it's late, it's almost 10 o'clock where I'm at, and so on the East Coast, it's what, what 11, 12, 1 a.m. over there. I know some of you stay up late like me though. I do my best work super late at night, so we got eight people here. Oh, 10 people <laughs> that are actually uh, awake and joining me now, so what is up? We are gonna be talking today about some common lighting mistakes that you got to avoid and I made these mistakes personally when I first started doing video production years ago and since I've learned to completely overcome those so I'm going to talk about those and then I want to talk about some really good lighting techniques that you've got to know and got to have in your arsenal when you get out there and start shooting videos so we're going to cover a whole bunch of things stick around with me and definitely leave your questions down below if you're wondering anything about lighting or cameras or gear or whatever, if you've seen some of my other videos and you have questions about something, definitely hit it down in the uh, <laughs> down in the box below. So, what is up? I might uh, pronounce your name wrong, but Shubham, Shub, Shubham. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm terrible at pronouncing names. But uh, what's up? Thanks for watching my uh, rig camera equipment. Uh, you know, different rig builds and stuff. Um, lots of fun. Uh, what time is it in India right now? I'm like, it's nighttime here. So it's like middle afternoon over there. Let me know down below. So, and guys, definitely comment as well. It's for those of you that are still sticking around, can you hear me okay? I don't have any headphones on. Um, I just wanna make sure that my mouth and the audio is syncing up okay before I go way deeper into this. Just, just leave a comment. Can you hear me okay? And is it synced? Okay, cool. All right, so I'm gonna keep on going here. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys can hear me and see me fine. Uh, so let's talk about some basic lighting stuff right off the bat. Oh, 10:30 a.m. Wow, in uh, India as well. You must be so crazy, strange. All right, hey, good, 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 good. Glad you can see me and hear me. That's great. All right, so uh, right off the bat, some common lighting mistakes. So when I first started lighting, everyone talks about three point lighting. It's like, it's the golden standard, right? Everyone's like three point lighting, three point lighting. And they just like drilled into your head. You watch all these YouTube videos, you, you know, read books and see like these diagrams about three point lighting. It's a lie. Don't do it. Okay. You know, take that with a grain of salt, but three point lighting is not always the best thing to do. So I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of interviews, tons of talking, talking headshots. And the most common thing people do is, okay, I'm going to set up my key lights. Like I have right here, got it right just out of the shot. And then I'm going to set up a fill light and you're going to put it on the opposite side. So you have two lights pointing at someone's face at the subject. And what that does when you do a key and a fill light is it creates cross shadows, especially if you don't do it right. So you'll get shadows, especially the nose shadow going across this way. And then that other fill light is gonna create an ugly nose shadow going this way. And I, I should have pulled up some shots just to show you guys, but I have some footage like this where I have really bad cross shadows in my interviews. And I remember when I was first starting and doing three point lighting, I was going, why does this look so terrible? Like it's supposed to be great. Everyone talks about how awesome it is and it just was not working great. So um, trust me, you wanna try something different there. So it's okay to use a fill light, but definitely do not use it at the same brightness as your key light. So let's say your key light was 100% and your fill, you put down to 50% or excuse me, at 100% as well, then you're gonna have two really hard lights creating those cross shadows. You might want to have it, your fill light much, much lower. It may be 40% or 50%, but even still, I do not prefer doing that because it usually creates cross shadows anyways, even if they're a little bit softer. So instead, you have this giant key light here, and I just have this coming through a soft box. It's nice and soft. And then on this side of my face, you can see that it's much darker. And depending on what you're filming, that might be okay. You might not need a fill at all. So if you were filming some drama or something, this is totally fine. And I actually like this look. There's a little bit of fill kind of bouncing back up from my desk, but let's say you wanted to bring that up. Well, 
instead of putting another light on the other side, save the money, don't even buy another light, and just grab a cheap little five-in-one reflector. So I'm gonna grab that. So these things are super handy and I use them all the time, especially the white side. So you can get this just out of the frame and you can see how this is kicking back a lot of light to this side of my face now. So if I look right into the camera, you can see my face is pretty well filled and I didn't even need another light and it doesn't create these ugly cross shadows. So this is definitely a much, much better way to get a fill with just bouncing the light back into the face instead of adding another light and adding more shadows. And once you add another light, it might start shadowing it might start sending shadows, not just across the subject's face, but onto the background. Now you're gonna have weird shadows going that way and weird shadows going that way on your background. And you don't want that. It's much, much better to just bounce the light. But let's say you can't afford a five-in-one reflector or you just can't get your hands on one for some reason. You can use a really, really cheap white foam core or foam board and this thing I believe was like 99 cents or maybe $2. And you can pretty much pick these up anywhere. You can get it at Walmart. You can find them at sometimes your grocery stores or the dollar store, super cheap. And this will do the exact same thing. Now I've just got it just out of frame and you can see how it's nicely bouncing back some light into my face and then take it away, more shadow side. So this is nothing new here. A lot of people know about bouncing light, but I just find so many people make this common mistake of saying, hey, three point lighting, I'm gonna have a key and a fill. It's much, much better in my opinion and my experience to have a key and then a bounce, some sort of bounce surface to get that back onto you. So I definitely, definitely recommend that. Now, if you wanna get a really large um, bounce source, then there's a lot of other options. There's much larger five-in-one reflectors. And then there's basically large, large insulation that you can buy at like your local hardware store. So see if I can show you a shot of that. My, my live streaming skills, I'm still working on them. So I, I'm not even sure if you guys could hear me when I cut away to that. Hopefully you could, but that's a piece of insulation that you could buy that is eight foot by four foot. So it's huge. It's just a ton of surface to bounce back onto your subject. And it was only $12.58 in the US. So that's definitely something you could pick up at your local hardware store for really cheap. So if you guys have questions about any of this, definitely you know, like I said, put a, put some comments down below and I'll be happy to answer any of them about, about lighting. So, um, so yeah, we've covered first off. Okay. Audio dropped off. Yeah. I think the audio cut out. Um, sorry, audio cut out when I went to the <laughs> screen sharing, I didn't have the mic there. So sorry about that. Um, anyway, so yeah, the main thing, don't point two lights directly at the same subject. That's going to mess it up. Now let's talk about some other lighting mistakes before I get into some really good common practices. So another common mistake that I see all the time is people put a backlight, which looks really nice. Like I have a hair light on right now hitting the back of my head and it, it looks good. It's kind of providing just a little bit of edge. You can see it kind of shining off the top of my hair. That's great. But sometimes people put backlights or hair lights on their subjects, but they blast it way too much and it looks unnatural and it just does not look good at all. So um, I'm going to turn up this backlight. So bear with me for a second. And I just want to show you guys just how how different it looks when you go from like about 20% right now to 100. And this is a mistake you're going to want to avoid. So let's check it out. All right, so here's 100% and you can see my hair is really bright now 
and it's actually clipping. So if I were to look at the back of the camera, I could see zebras and see that this is actually clipping and does not look good. And it just looks unnatural. So when you're doing interviews, you don't want the light to be too harsh because it doesn't look super good. So I recommend if you're gonna do a backlight, do it nice and soft. And even if you can, diffuse that backlight so it doesn't look as harsh and unnatural. You just want a little bit to edge out your subject from the background so they don't blend in. Now I'm gonna go turn that back down so this looks a little bit more natural. All right, there we go. Now you can see it looks more normal. It doesn't look like there's a giant spotlight hitting the back of my head. Okay, so I'm gonna take a look at the comments here, see what you guys are, see what you guys are up to. Jan says uh, she likes that I'm <laughs> discussing some of my previous failures. Yeah, I've had a ton. I can go back and look at so much old footage and things that I've shot and yeah, it, it's cringe. It's definitely cringe, but that's good because it means I've improved and gotten better over the years. If you look back at your stuff from one year ago, two years ago, and it doesn't make you kind of go, then it's probably not a good sign because you probably haven't improved that much. I can look at stuff that I shot six months ago and go, oh, why did I do it like that? So you definitely want to be improving constantly and that's okay. Some of my old stuff was definitely not good and you can see some of that on my channel if you go way back. Um, oh, okay. So you're saying that audio is only on the right because you're in stereo instead of mono. Ooh. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I'll be able to figure that one out in this uh in this but i can try and figure it out sorry guys um let's see if i can figure out you can hear me okay uh just on <laughs> the right side for the next one i'll figure that out live streaming is still very new to me and uh, at least just doing it personally i do a lot of live streaming for work but it, it's a different setup with uh, more professional equipment than even we have here. So hopefully you can still hear me, still hear me okay, but uh, thank you La Hamada for pointing that out. I'll figure that one out. All right, and then we have another comment from, K I'm sorry, I'm butchering names today. Kataju, you say, uh, can you please tell us the cheap lights that are available in stores like Ikea? Okay, so, um, yeah, so some cheap lights that are available in Ikea. So I made a video uh, a few years ago, I think it's maybe a year and a half, almost two years ago now, about some really cool like um, LED tube lights that they used to sell and they were called spanced lights. They were limited edition, but they were just really, really cool tube lights that you could buy for pretty cheap. I think they're maybe 50 bucks but they no longer have them. They are limited edition. So there are a ton of other cool lights you can get from Ikea. I'd have to look that up and see what ones there are. I have like different practicals. They have so many cool, interesting lamps and stuff that you can use in your backgrounds. But as far as using them as like main key lights for shooting videos, I'm not sure that I would recommend buying Ikea lights like that. They're more of just good practical lights for your background. All right, so, okay. Some of you are still saying that you can hear me okay. I'm glad. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, just, I'll, I'll try and answer as many questions as I can. Um, La Hamada again says, can you explain how you transitioned, transitioned from IT, um, to doing my own production? So you're in the exact same spot. IT is your passion. Okay. So yeah, just briefly, I know, um, a lot of you guys probably don't know really anything about who I am, where I came from, that sort of thing. I made a couple videos about that, about how I used to work for Google and Apple and some different tech companies. Yeah, so I went to school for business technology and right out of school, I did the safe thing and got a job in an office doing that corporate lifestyle. And it was good and it paid well and it was very secure and had all the benefits, all the good stuff. But I've been doing video all along on the side and building up clients. So I guess to answer your question, um, how did I make that transition? Well, because I had clients that I was doing just on nights and on weekends, I was kind of keeping up with that. And I 
it was really my passion. It was much more interesting to me to be doing video. So there may be a lot of you guys out there that are in the same boat. You're doing video on the side, but you have a normal nine to five job or whatever it is. It's really going to bring in the main in, uh, source of income. Well, for me, I wasn't sure that I could, you know, just completely quit that job and just go full time freelance and make enough money doing that. That's kind of scary. A lot of people worry about that. Well, for me, luckily, a production company that I had done many videos for in the past over the years while I had been working on the side reached out to me and said, hey, you know, we love what you're doing. We see the videos you're making um, and the work that you're doing. It looks great. We'd love to actually bring you on basically full time. Uh, I'm still a contractor to them and I can still do freelance work. But they're like, hey, we want to bring you on full time to be doing shoots with us and making videos and such. So in reality, I am working there full time with a production company uh, in a studio, but I also still do freelance work and of course this YouTube channel. So for you, if you want to make the jump from IT to doing video full time, I definitely recommend build it up as much as you possibly can on the side. Stay up late like I am right now, 10 p.m. making videos, editing late into the night or early in the morning, whenever you find time, edit on the weekends. And if you can keep on doing those sort of things, then opportunities will continue to present themselves. And maybe you can just look around at local job listings and see if there are any full-time production jobs. And then you just have a huge array of videos that people can go and look at. So, sorry, that was kind of a long side tangent on that, but I hope I answered your question. Okay. Okay, um, Summit says, can we get creative in outdoor shoots with sun as the only lighting source? Yes, yes, you definitely can. It's obviously much more difficult to control the sun, but you can get creative with it. So first of all, if you want a really hard light looking source, you can go out in the middle of the day and shoot under direct sunlight. There are a lot of shows and movies that do that, especially Westerns. They prefer to shoot out in high noon and it gives it that really moody look, especially with, you know, a hat on and their shadowed faces and such. But I would say if you actually want to control the light, the best thing to do is use diffusion. So actually that loops me right into, hey, here's some ways you could use diffusion with either, you know, video production lights like I have here or out in direct sunlight. So I'm going to grab a large piece of diffusion that I have right here. So stick around, I'm gonna show you exactly how to control the sun. So I know this is gonna be echoey because the mic's far away, but. Right. Okay, so this big boy is a four by four diffusion. All right, and I'm smacking things all over the place here because it's huge. But this is a four by four, so four foot by four foot silk diffusion. And this is perfect for, of course, diffusing normal video lights or the sun. And I've actually used this on many shoots outside. So you throw this onto a C stand and get it blocking the sun just right so that your subjects are now in really soft diffuse light and it makes their faces look so good, their skin tones look so good. And I just, I can't recommend it more. If you're shooting out in bright sunlight, one of the best ways to control that light is just to just diffuse it with something like a giant four by four silk. And that'll make your lighting look so much better. Um, but if you can't afford something like this or you can't travel with something like this because this one doesn't break down, it's from Matthews and it has a full metal frame. You can't actually fit this in a lot of cars. Like I can't get this to fit into a sedan, but I could fit it in the back of an SUV or my truck. So if you can't afford something like this though, I think it's at about 130 bucks. So not bad, definitely worth it. And it'll last probably a good decade. But let's say you can't run around with something like that. We'll go back to the five in one reflector. And I just, I honestly, <laughs> I think I've had this five in one reflector for seven or eight years. And it's a cheap one from newer that I bought on Amazon as like one of the very first things I ever purchased when I started getting into filmmaking for like, I don't know, 15 or 20 bucks. And it's still good all these years later. 
Definitely pick one up if you don't already have one. But that aside, it has diffusion on the inside. So I took out that outside layer and now we've got another source of diffusion. So this obviously will do the exact same thing as that large four x four silk. And you could get this on a stand or have someone hold it. I've done that so many times. Just have another person hold it up, diffuse the light on your people outside, and you're gonna get much, much softer, more beautiful lighting on your subjects. And then when you're done, obviously just break it down, throw it in your bag or your box or whatever, and you're good to go. Much more portable and you know than a giant four x four silk. But I guess to answer your question, hopefully, that's one of the best ways to control sunlight when you're outside. And I'll get into even more ways uh, as, as we continue down the video here. All right. Just taking a look at your guys' comments. All right. Yeah, La, La Hamada again. Hopefully that was helpful. My, my comments on switching from IT to production. And newer definitely has really cheap video stuff, but I found that a lot of it has been pretty, um, pretty good, pretty good for the price. And yeah, so uh, Summit, hopefully that helped with, uh, with the lighting outside stuff. Hopefully, hopefully that made sense. All right, so let's continue on talking about some different lighting techniques here. So um, when you are lighting your subjects, we already talked about it's not good to have two cross lights across a subject's face. But let's just say you're just focusing on the key light. You always want to diffuse that. So if you set up a light, whatever it is, let's say it's an LED panel or it's a Fresnel light, maybe it's an airy light, whatever it is, don't just point it directly at your subject and call it good. It, I have seen so many people do this where they're like, hey, we need a light, we need to light this scene. Just grab a light, point it at the subject and say, it's lit. No. It's terrible. It never looks good. You must, 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 must diffuse or modify that light. If you don't, it's going to look harsh and hard and it just does not look professional. And it also creates a lot of shine off of people's faces. So if you find that your subjects, when you're filming them, whether it's interviews or, you know, some dialogue scene or something are looking very shiny. And let's say you can't put more makeup on them to kind of mat out that shine diffuse the light more and it gets rid of that shine but as soon as you get rid of that diffusion boom ping the lights bouncing all over the place so number one that's that's one of the best things you can do is diffuse the light and we've already talked about two things you can diffuse the light with one of them is that five in one reflector with the diffusion piece inside or a four by four silk if you don't have one of those you can pick up one of these really cheap um soft boxes and this one's from diffuse and it's kind of a uh a standard like one size fits all and it's for one by one or one foot by one foot led panels so i'm gonna pop it open here so you guys can see what it looks like it's super easy i love that it folds away just kind of like a five on one reflector and then it goes rigid with these little i don't know support bars on the side And then you just put your light, you know, obviously you just put this right on your light. And then you have a nice soft light source. It can make your light source a little bit bigger. And of course that diffusion breaks it up and it, it just works really easy and it packs down really small, throw it in your bag, throw it in a Pelican, whatever it is. And I believe this one was between 40 or $50 on Amazon. Sometimes you can find it for cheaper. So definitely check out the, the defuse it's actually what i have on this led light panel that's lighting me right now and they come in different shapes they have square and they have circle um honestly i recommend the circle and here's why the best light in someone's eyes the, the most natural looking is a round light so when you talk about getting an eye light and cinematographers talk about this all the time like all the time i hear them saying hey you know, we're filming it, da, 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 and to get an eye light, we just put a little light right here, et cetera, et cetera. So to, you know, to lighten up the eyes and make it look like the people are alive and not dead. So the best looking eye lights are round. So I prefer round soft boxes because in nature, things are round, uh, normal lights are round, the sun is round, but a square, a large square eye light in someone's eye doesn't look as natural. So I always recommend the round soft boxes if you can go with that. All right. So take a look at these comments again, see what's going on. 
Yeah, so Magic Mike Films says, what kind of light are you using for this live video right now? So like I was saying, I'm using one of these little pop-up, uh, one of these pop-up soft boxes. It's just out of the frame, but it's a round one. Um, you can kind of see it in the reflection of my glasses right there. Little round soft box, and I'm just using a one by one LED light panel. This one is from Falcon Eyes, it's an RGB. I just have it on normal 3200 Kelvin. That's another thing, just a little key, like a little, um, I don't know, pro tip for you. Skin tones usually look best at 3200 Kelvin, a warmer color temperature. You can definitely light skin tones with daylight at 5600 Kelvin. That can look amazing and fantastic as well. But I always prefer 3200 Kelvin because people like to look tan. They like to look warm and alive. But when you put a cooler blue light on them, like 5600 Kelvin and above, they can start to look more ghostly and dead and you don't want that. So I prefer a warmer light. Of course, my camera is also set to 3200 Kelvin. So white looks white, but even still, it just looks warmer. So that's the one light I, that I have on here for the live setup. And then if you're just joining now, um, I had a lighting setup in the back there and it was, uh, it's our hair lights and I was showing people how you could turn it up really bright or not. But that is a Aperture LS Mini 20D. And so that's kicking some hair light back here. It's daylight balance, so it looks a little bit cooler. And then I had two RGB, um, LED light bars just out of frame, giving us that kind of cool green and blue cast. So yeah, one, two, three, we got four lights set up in here. So that's that's the lighting setup here. So hopefully that answers your question, Magic Mike Films. All right. Taking a look again at your questions. I'm like the worst at talking while looking at your questions and trying to like think. So sorry for the silence, but Let's take a look at what else is going on here. Okay, um, La Hamada, great question. He says, what's your advice on lighting with two or more different light temperatures? I do that all the time. It's I've actually made a couple videos on it. I'll try to leave some links to them down in the description below so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Um, maybe I can actually pull some of that up right now if I can, if I can <laughs> pull that off. But basically, I have 3200 Kelvin light temperature on my face right now. Cause like I said, it's nice and warm, but then in the background, my hair light is 5,600 Kelvin. So it's much cooler blue. So if you're lighting with two different color temperatures, that can look great. You don't have to match them. I prefer to have a backlight that's cooler and then a key light that's much warmer on the skin tones. I do that all the time, making those two different color temperatures different like that. So that's one really basic thing you can do. Um, and I'm trying to find my video on, on that whole thing. So I can just leave a link to it for you. So you can see what I'm talking about. It's in here somewhere. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm skipping right past it. There it is. All right. Try and pull it up without any of the audio coming in. So I'll leave, I'll leave a link to this so you can check it out. Hopefully it's helpful. Yeah, so there's one on lighting with mixed color temperatures. Now, as, as I said earlier, we've got a warm light on me, we have a cool light on the background, and then I have two different colored lights in the background. So don't be afraid to light with multiple color temperatures. If you watch any great cinematographer behind the scenes or you know read any magazines on like lighting of a movie or something, they're always using different color temperatures. They don't light everything just daylight balanced, say at 5600 Kelvin. They don't do the key and the backlight and the background lights and everything at the same light. Usually they're using so many different color temperatures. Like let's say they have lamps in the background, some practicals. Well, a lot of times lamps are at like 2000 Kelvin, like really warm or 2500 Kelvin, but then the light on the characters um, a little bit cooler. And then, you know, you might have some night light coming in from moonlight and that's really cool at like 6,000 or 8,000 Kelvin. So there's just so many creative ways that you can do it, but, you really have to play with it and start mixing those color temperatures to see how your camera handles it and see how the sensor handles it. So hopefully that kind of helps you in the video I linked below, helps you understand how to do some mixed color temperature lighting. All right. The beat says, please give a wide view of your studio. Yeah, um, <laughs> I would love to do that, but the camera is like locked off. I can't really move it around. Um, but I've done a whole video on how I set this studio up and you can check that out on my channel as well. Um, maybe I'll try and leave a link to that so you can see 
you know, oh, here we go. Um, setting up, it's all, it's all about how I set up a permanent home studio so that it's really easy to just get up and start filming. So I'll leave a link to this one. You can definitely check it out. See the full studio. Sorry. Uh, can't really turn the camera great right now. But let's see what else we got going on in the comments. Again, thank you everyone for joining. We've got 16 viewers right now. Not a, not a lot, but it's good for uh, 10 p.m. Like 10:30 uh, p.m. where I'm at. But you know, elsewhere it's much much later. So, all right. Um, let's see here. Okay, couple couple other questions. Johnny D is asking about the xt30 so the the i believe that's the fujifilm xt30 i haven't used it before but i just got the fujifilm um and i just made a whole video about this i posted it on the channel yesterday the fujifilm xt4 and i'm already really loving this camera beautiful build quality beautiful image and such a great upgrade to the xt3 that had no in-body image stabilization and of course it has that flip out screen which is fantastic for vlogging. Now, I know your question was, hey, what's a good camera? Or it looked like you said, what's a good gimbal for doing vlogging? Um, I haven't used the Cyru P1 gimbal before. I've used, of course, the Ronin S and Feiyu Tech AK4000, the Crane V2, um, the Movi, a handful of different gimbals. Um, as far as vlogging with a gimbal, I'm not sure I would do that personally. Obviously it'll look really smooth and good, but if you're vlogging, you want the bare minimum amount of equipment on you. Like you want to be able to just whip out your camera, get the shot and go. Um, I think setting up the gimbal, you'll find out will be way too much of a pain to like get it all turned on, rigged and, and hold it out and it'll be really heavy. So I recommend if you have a flip out screen or you can throw a monitor on there, just hold it as smooth as you can use a wide angle lens possibly a lens with optical um, optical stabilization because you said hey that camera doesn't have in-body image stabilization try to get a lens that does have stabilization or just hold it as smooth as you can um, but you definitely could use a gimbal that's up to you I just think if you're doing a lot of vlogging that you'll get sick of the the gimbal I've tried kind of doing some self filming vlogging stuff with a gimbal and you don't want to do that long term at least at least I wouldn't so all right. Um, okay, so Lahamada, La great question. He says, so how would you set the white balance if you have different light temperatures? So here's the deal. And, and this is a great question. Whatever the key light is in your scene, you want to set the white balance in your camera to that so that humans look normal, so that their skin tone looks normal. So right now, 3200 Kelvin um, soft light right here being my key light. So my camera is also set to 3200 Kelvin for the white balance. So my skin tones look normal and white looks white. You can see I have a little white logo, a little alien on my shirt and he looks white. So that's where you wanna set your white balance to. Now, the daylight balanced hair light behind me is 5600 Kelvin and you can see my hair looks a little bit bluish, but that's okay. Now, let's say I'd said, hey, I'm gonna set my um, Kelvin and my camera to daylight balance. Well, that wouldn't be a very good idea because all of a sudden this light would look just crazy, crazy um, warm. So you don't want to you don't want to do that. You want to set your white balance to whatever your key light is. Usually, that's that's really the best rule of thumb. So I hope that answers the question for you. All right. Yeah, Johnny D again says the XT30 doesn't have in-body image stabilization. This gimbal may help. Yeah, it, a gimbal would definitely help. Um, again, I'm, I think you might get a little bit tired of doing it, but definitely give it a try. If it's a cheap gimbal, you said I think it was 150 bucks. Give it a try. See how well it works for you. Um, if it's on Amazon, you know you can try it out for 30 days, and if you hate it, return it. <laughs> so de definitely give it a go. All right, let's see. Uh, another question from Richard Myland. Milland, I hope I'm saying that right. You say, do you get color in camera or in post? Um, okay, so I think what you're talking about is like, do I film flat or an S-log or do I kind of bake in the colors? I hope that's what you're asking. Um, and to answer that question, it just, 
obviously depends on what I'm doing. So right now I am filming with the Sony a6500 and I'm filming in picture profile three, but I have it set up with the Canon EOS color look and I've done a whole video on that but basically it's like how to make Sony colors look like Canon because everyone loves Canon color science right so I have that and it's baking in the footage obviously but I'm doing that because this is live and I'm not going to be doing any color grading if I had this in s log right now on the Sony it would look terrible it would look flat no contrast obviously so for live streaming I'm definitely baking in my color but if I have time to do all the color grading and everything in post-production let's say I'm filming something for a business client um, yes I will definitely film in s log or um, film on the black magic or on my new Fuji film I will film an F log so of course I'm getting the most dynamic range possible for my highlights and my shadows and then I'll do the color grading later usually I'll add a LUT as a starting ground to get it kind of to a rec 709 space and then I'll do my creative color grading after that so hopefully that answers your question um, for lighting or excuse me for coloring in camera all right Thank you everyone uh, uh, for the positive feedback on the feed. I'm glad some people are up with me late. I got a little Mountain Dew going. Really, I shouldn't be drinking caffeine because I got to go to bed soon, but I'm up. I'm with you guys. I love live streaming and uh, hanging out with you guys. Keep keep the questions coming. I love and all that. All right, so what is color contrast, says Spandan the Beats. So what is color contrast? Um, yeah, the, the, the easiest way to answer that, and maybe, maybe you're getting mixed up what I was talking about with color and contrast. Um, if, you're, if you're filming in flat picture profile or in film on the Black Magics, it doesn't really add any contrast to the image. So your blacks look really, mm, they don't look very dark and your whites don't look very bright and then it doesn't add a lot of color, so it's not very saturated. Um, that would be the best way to describe that. But then later in post, you add that contrast back in, make it look punchy, and you add that saturation to make it look bright and colorful and vibrant. Now, if you're talking about color contrast in lighting, then we can talk all about that. Again, I've got a warm light, I've got a cool light. We have these other background lights that are adding color contrast to the image. So that's the simplest way to say that um, if you're talking about lighting. All right, taking a look again at your guys' questions, see what's what's happening. Okay, David Joseph, what's up, man? He says, when you're lighting a scene, do you ever allow your camera um, to set white balance or do you always manually set it? Um, fantastic question. I never, ever, 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 ever use um, auto white balance. No. <laughs> yeah, I, w I wouldn't ever use that um, because honestly, let's say that you are filming indoors and you have your scene lit nicely. Maybe you're using some warm lights, but there's a window in the scene and you have it on auto white balance. Well, it'll start changing the color temperature of your image as maybe some clouds roll by and more sun comes in and out and it'll be extremely hard to fix that in post because it's baked in. So at the beginning of your image like might look warmer and then later on in the video it looks cooler and it's going back and forth. It just looks terrible. Like for example, if you grab your iPhone or other phone and you pull up the camera app and you look at it, it sets, wa it sets the white balance for you automatically. You, you really can't do anything about that. But let's say that you kind of have a light behind you and then you kind of tour turn towards the sun also the white balance is changing again so that's just a really good example of how the white balance constantly changing looks bad so definitely set white definitely set your white balance manually and leave it there if you're not sure what your white balance is supposed to be set to a good general rule of thumb is that lights indoors are typically tungsten at 3200 kelvin but a lot of them can be you know leds now that look cooler and when you're outside Typically for daylight, it's 5,600 Kelvin. So that if you don't want to use, if you want to use auto white balance or you don't know which Kelvin to go to, usually there's icons on it that you can set for indoor lighting or outdoor lighting or cloudy. And you can just click on those icons and it'll get you close. But I definitely recommend doing some research and learning what's the best white balance to use. Um, so 
Yeah, and sorry, I'm like fixing my glasses a lot. I don't ever wear glasses. I just got these during this whole lockdown. I haven't worn glasses for like 15 years, so still not used to it. All right. Uh, taking a look again at some of your questions. Let's see what's happening. Okay, so uh, La Hamada, you talked about um, my video on infrared light on the black magic cameras. Um, and I think what you're saying is, is it worth buying a black magic camera, although it has IR pollution? And the answer to that is definitely yes. Uh, the Pocket 4K is a great, great, great value camera. I think it's $1,300 right now, something around that range. And that's just a fantastic price for everything that's packed into it. You have a giant five inch screen, you get B-RAW, which is so cool being able to really adjust your white balance and your ISO and obviously your different colors and everything in post-production in DaVinci Resolve. So even though there is some IR pollution, it's not a big deal. The IR pollution, and if you guys aren't familiar go check out the video on my channel all about infrared pollution. It really only happens when you're using ND filters with the Blackmagic cameras. If you're not using ND filters, you're really not gonna be seeing much IR pollution and it's not really something you have to worry about. And sometimes you can use um, ND filters and see no IR pollution if you're not using that strong of an ND filter. So I don't think it's a huge issue that you need to worry about that frequently. And if you are using a lot of ND, just get an IR cut filter like I showed you in that video. Definitely recommend the Blackmagic cameras. Um, really, really great cameras. Or like I've been saying, the new Fujifilm X-T4 or X-T3. It's a little bit more expensive than the Blackmagic, but it shoots in F-Log and you can get full 10 bit, um, 60 frames per second out of this camera. So it's an absolute beast. It has better battery life than the Blackmagic. It's obviously a little bit smaller, easier to balance on a gimbal. I've been really liking this. I'm, I'm not gonna switch completely over to this. I'll definitely be using my Blackmagic Pocket 6K still, but this is a great camera. So I can't recommend it anymore. Um, okay, so Scott Stevenson. What's up, man? Um, says, what's a low budget way to double break your key? That's easy. Um, honestly, I was showing this earlier. If you had just joined us, um, we have the five in one reflector. Woo! One of my favorite little devices. Um, you could buy two of these to double break your lights. Um, you can get really cheap diffusion to double break it. Most LED lights come with some bit of diffusion that you can throw on there. Like, let's see. Okay, some of my older, cheaper LED lights came with this little bit of diffusion. It's frosted. It doesn't do much, but it directly connects to the light magnetically. But I would never just use this. After using this, typically what I did when I was first starting out, I would just throw up a 5-in-1 reflector, and that would be enough to get it nice and soft. Um, but if, if you want to double break it, definitely use something like a soft box and then put another piece of diffusion a few feet in front of that. Don't put it right on top of the soft box. If you layer them, for example, like this, and I'm showing you guys this because I see this mistake all the time. Um, people are like, hey, I want to diffuse my light, make it look good. Even if they want to double break a soft box, they'll take it like this, and then they'll take another piece of diffusion and just layer it on top. Eh, wrong, major, major mistake. If you just clip it to the front like that, is it going to diffuse your light a little more? Sure, but really what it's gonna do is cut out the luminosity of your light. It's gonna get less bright, which means you're gonna have to turn it up or turn up the camera settings so you get more light. And that's all it's gonna do. It's really not gonna make it much softer. You need distance between the diffusion and the light. So a better thing to do would be to get, I don't know, about three feet or so between the second piece of diffusion and that first one. Then this no longer becomes the key light. This now becomes the giant key light. And you know, this is like about four feet by four feet around. And that's a big, beautiful, soft light. So. Uh, hopefully that answers your question about double breaking. It's really simple. You don't need anything fancy. Just make sure you get that second piece of diffusion a few feet away from your first one so that the light can fill that whole surface area and make it really soft and gorgeous. 
All right. Okay, so another question here from Richard Myland. Okay, he says, um, example, if you're shooting a campfire scene, what would your color temperature be in camera if you're not shooting raw? Around 3200 Kelvin, uh, it, it wouldn't look warm as it should. Okay, that's a great question. Um, I have shot a couple campfire scenes and I think I've done some behind the scenes on it as well. Try and link to that. I, that's, a, that's a good thing. I've got, I've got an old... Re, uh, excuse me. <laughs> I have an old reserve of, of lighting uh, videos that I can share with you guys quickly to, to answer your questions, luckily. So I'm going to leave a link to that that you can definitely check out after this live stream that shows lighting a campfire scene. Um, I've done that, actually, believe it or not, a couple times. But essentially what I, what I would do is if I'm lighting a campfire scene, um, I'm going to key light my subjects really warm. So the warmest that my light can go. So if it can go beneath 3200 Kelvin, let's say it can go down to 3000 or 2800, I'm going to light them like that. And then I'll set the color temperature in my camera a little bit more warm than that. So let's say your color temperature of the light on your subject is 3000 Kelvin. In camera, instead of matching that at 3000 Kelvin and making white look white, I want them to look a little bit warmer. So maybe you can go four or 500 Kelvin above that in camera. So 3000 on the light, and then on the camera, go to 3,400 Kelvin or 3,500 Kelvin. And that'll make their skin tones look extra warm. And let's say you have a 3,200 Kelvin light on them because that's that's the warmest you can go. Well, in camera, go maybe 3,600 Kelvin. You know, set that custom white balance and they'll look a little bit more warm. Um, that'd be my best recommendation. But if you're actually have a fire it'll naturally just glow really warm that's what i did in that little short film i just linked down below for you it glowed really warm and made it look really good but now it's a little bit cliche but i i love it and i think a lot of cinematographers and videographers out there love it i love that blue look of night light and moonlight i really do i just like that blue and cyan look so when i shoot those night scenes with those warm lights from a fire or whatever night, you know, like street lamps or whatever, I always try to add that cool blue look. And you can do that just by using a 5600 Kelvin light, but having your white balance in camera at 3200 Kelvin. So that daylight balance will look extra blue. But if you wanna give it a real punch of blue, throw a CTB on there or color temperature blue gel on there to make it even more blue. And that'll give you really great color contrast in camera, very blue and very warm. So hopefully that answers your question. I know this is kind of technical. Some people are dropping off. I'm sure it's getting boring <laughs> on that, but we'll uh, try and keep going. All right. So yeah, Johnny D says, have you customized the settings on your X-T4? Yes, I have done a couple customizations on this. Again, this is brand new. I literally got this just a couple days ago, so I'm just starting to shoot with it. But I did a custom button on the top for zebras to quickly turn them on and off. And then I have the histogram on this custom button. But there's so many custom buttons on this, it's sweet. You can do, I think, seven. And I haven't customized them all yet because honestly, it came with pretty much everything I need really, really well set up. But I, the most recent video I posted on this channel is all about how I set this camera up. So definitely watch this after the stream because I dive into my settings on that camera more. All right, another little drink break here. Mm. All right. Okay, uh, Spanned in the Beat says, is the Sony A7R4 good for documentary films? Um, if you already have the Sony a7R4, yes, of course, whatever camera you own and have is great for documentary films or making videos of any kind. Just start with what you have. The first camera that I started on, like seriously, was the Canon Rebel T3i. You can get that camera for like 200 bucks now used, but it's still a great camera. It was the first one with a good flip out screen, 1080p video and 30 frames per second. I love that camera and I just beat it to death with all the videos that I made. So yes, that's a fantastic camera for really photography and video. But if you're looking at that as one, hey, should I buy this for documentary filmmaking? 
No, I probably wouldn't. It's definitely on the more expensive side. The A7R line is more expensive than the A7S, which in my opinion is better for video. It has better low light. You're still getting that full frame image. But if you really want a documentary film camera, check out one of my videos I made all about whether you should get a, uh, you know, a professional video camera or a DSLR. And that, that will kind of help answer some of those questions. But Basically, I think if you're doing documentaries, something like the Sony FS5, if you can find it used, is much better. And if you can find that used for less than $2,000 now, but it has a handheld grip and, uh, you know, it has a spot where you can plug in full-size XLRs and it has internal ND filters built in, variable ND filters right into the camera body and the battery life on it is like five, six hours. So it's gonna last you most of the day. Much better camera setup for documentary filmmaking than a little mirrorless camera. But if you wanna use the camera for multiple things, not just documentary filmmaking, then maybe get a mirrorless camera. So hopefully that answers your question there. All right. Again, thank you guys for, for all the comments, all the love. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun chatting with you guys. We've been going for almost an hour, um, 54 minutes on the clock. If you want me to keep on going, I will definitely keep on, keep on streaming. There's still a handful of things for me to talk about with you guys. We still got 11 people here. So, all right. Um, we talked about soft boxes. We talked about getting round eye lights. We talked about diffusing light, double diffusing light indoors, with uh, video lights and outdoors with the sun. Uh, we talked about silks. One thing I wanna talk about real quick is really cheap diffusion. And you can pick this up on Amazon for about, I think $18, maybe 20 bucks. This is just a big piece of diffusion. It's, it's cloth and you can, you know, just hang this. Um, and diffuse your light really well. And this one's huge, it's like 20 feet by uh, like 10 feet or something like that, it's massive. And I just have this on hand for a couple different reasons. Having a big piece of diffusion like this is fantastic for covering windows. So let's say you're shooting something inside, whether it's a documentary or you know short film or whatever it is, you can hang something like this in front of the windows to help soften that light even more so that the sunlight isn't so harsh. It also controls it a little bit so that the brightness isn't changing as dramatically because you've diffused it with something large like this. And you can you don't have to pick up one that's you know specifically made for it from Amazon. You can use shower curtains. I've done a whole video on that. There's different frosted shower curtains that are even cheaper, maybe like $5 at Walmart or Target that will work great as well. But I think something like that is fantastic to have on hand for making your videos better. You definitely wanna diffuse um, and have different options for diffusing. And I could see a, a bunch of reasons why you would want something large like that, especially when you're out in bright sunlight for 20 bucks. I could hang this on a couple of light stands and diffuse a, a couple characters, three or four people could stand on the other side of this and get really, really nicely diffused. So I wanted to point that out. We talked about white form, white foam core and how you could use that as a bounce, as a fill light on the other side of someone's face instead of doing two lights. Um, we talked about the white bead board you could get from Home Depot. Um, so one more thing uh, in, in that area that I wanna talk about for sure is using negative fill. So a lot of times people just talk about lighting, lighting, lighting. What are the best lights? What are the best, you know, pieces of diffusion and stuff? Well, negative fill is just as important because as cinematographers, as videographers, we have to control light. So if I just blast a light at me, well, now that light is hitting this back wall. It's bouncing back on me here. The light behind me is bouncing off this wall and then bouncing. So it's bouncing all over the place, right? Light is like kinetic. It's moving constantly. So you have to control that with negative fill, which is just a fancy way of saying pretty much something black, like a black piece of cloth. And so I'm gonna grab a black um, little piece of foam core here. Again, this thing's like a buck 50, something like that at you know, any craft store. And this works fantastic for negative fill. So I'm gonna look right in the camera here and add this and you can see that it, Let's see if you can see a little bit of shadow kind of come up on the side of my face. Not much because the computer light is coming back at me, but if there was some bright source or a white wall to the side of me, 
this key light would be bouncing right back into my face. So you just put something like this black foam core on the other side of the face to bring that down and make it a little more shadowy and dramatic. Really cheap, easy way to block light. Or if you're shooting out in bright sunlight, you could have someone hold this up and provide a little bit of shade. This is a cheap solution. Um, I have a couple of these on hand so I can use them just for different things, blocking lights or keeping light. Like I can use it as a flag on an LED light and keep it, uh, allow it basically to cut light off of the wall so light isn't spilling onto the wall. It's super cheap, super light, easy to clamp up and everything like that. But if you want a more professional solution, you can buy real flags, which I'm gonna grab right now and show you guys um, what that looks like. So here is a larger flag. I believe this is a 32 inch by 48 inch. So it's basically has this nice soft black um, kind of duvetine on it. And this allows the flag to suck up light. So instead of it ba -boing, bouncing off of it, like that foam core could be a little bit bouncy because it's a little sheen. This just eats the light for breakfast. So it's it's really nice um it has a nice full metal frame of course it doesn't break down so this is not something you're going to throw into a bag or a pelican it's more something you're going to keep in your car or your truck i recommend grabbing a couple flags like this so again you can flag off light so you can flag off lights keep light from bouncing all over your set um, these are super handy and this um, little kind of stud on the end really is going to have to be used with a C stand. So if you don't already own C stands as a videographer, cinematographer, definitely, definitely, definitely recommend adding that to your kit. Get one or two C stands. There's a couple cheap ones from, from newer and impact that you can buy on Amazon and they work great. But this is a way of controlling light and just, you know, adding some dimension to your scene. So there's just not light going all over the place. There's a small one. Now let's grab the big boy. Sorry, my room is getting really uh, crowded now with all this stuff. Boom! All right, so <laughs> here's the massive, massive floppy. So this is a 4x4 four four black floppy. And this is just so useful on set. You could use it for so many different things. One, of course, flagging off light. But let's say you're outside and there's just a ton of light. Well, you could put this up and it creates a big giant, you know, shadow for your characters and your subjects or your interviewee so they're not under direct sunlight. Now, this is a floppy, so it's not just 4x4, four four, it's actually 8x4. So I'll show you guys that. So it's massive, opens up huge. Woo! <laughs> so, so yeah, that flap obviously flops down four feet and I'm fighting with it here. I'm gonna get it out of the way. But just a huge flag and it works fantastic. So because it has that f you know flap, you could put it over someone's head and then the other side kind of goes to the side of them so you get a nice shadow side of the face that blocks sunlight and then you have a topper so they're not getting direct sunlight over their head either so that's fantastic use it all the time it's also a great shade on set so if you have a focus polar or a director's monitor or whatever it is you can actually set that up as a little shade station and i believe that was about 150 dollars these items these giant silks these four by four silks and black flags can't typically get on Amazon. Sometimes you can find them on Amazon, but typically you're gonna buy them from places like Adorama, B&H Photo, and other like more professional video sites. Um, but they're fantastic to have on set. Great way to control light. So yeah, using black flags and using black duvetine and hanging it on walls or tacking it to the ceiling is a great way to control light. Most ceilings, when you're like shooting on location, have white ceilings. And so, uh, you know, that light 
bounces all around and then it gets diffused off the ceiling and you're like, why are my walls so bright? And ugh, it just looks ugly. Well, if you have the ability to do this, you could bring black duvetine or basically giant rolls of black muslin or black cloth and you could tack it to the ceiling. I've heard from a lot of cinematographers shooting, you know, movies that they will put black wrap up all over the place. So they will just cover the place in black to just basically make it a black box and control their light. So they put up light where they want it and the room doesn't decide where the light goes. All right. Um, La Hamada says, I have no idea on how to flag a shot and where to buy. Yeah, so um, like I was saying, Adorama, b and those are great places to buy flags, but as far as flagging a shot, you don't need to flag every shot. There's there's no reason to do that. But for this for this example here, talking head, let's say there was just too much light coming from this side hitting my face. Um, I could put this flag just out of the shot, just out of frame, and then it would block that light from hitting my face and keep it nice and more moody and dramatic. You can't tell here because my computer monitor is lighting me up, but that would be just a simple way of flagging a subject. But let's say this light right here was spilling onto a wall. I could get it out of the shot and now it's not hitting the back wall to the side of me. So there's just a lot of different uses for flags and you kind of have to play with it. Like it's, it's those moments when you're like, man, there's light hitting this or that. And why is it going on the background that you need to go and grab a flag? Um, so it's hard to explain like when you're going to need it exactly. But when you're on set, you'll realize like, oh, this would be a great spot to block light. That's that's why you would use it. Um, Scott Stevenson says two by three. Um, let's see. Yeah, maybe that one is a two by three that I have. Can't remember uh, <laughs> the size of the flag exactly, but they come in all different shapes, sizes, really small, thin ones, really big ones. So definitely recommend picking some up either way. Um, yeah, so I think we've covered just about everything when it, that I can think of for this, this live stream on lighting, diffusing lights, double diffusing lights, color temperatures and flags. Um, what else do you guys have questions on? I'll stick around for a couple more minutes. It's getting pretty late here. It's 11 PM almost. Um, let me know, you know, if you have questions about anything you've seen on my channel, camera rig builds, editing stuff, whatever it is. Let me know. I'm going to stick around for a couple minutes, hang out with you guys, and then, uh, you know, we'll start wrapping this up. Um, it's been a lot of fun talking about this stuff. All right. Okay, Richard um, Mylan says he wanted to buy proper C stands but couldn't find them. Um, yeah, so I, like... <laughs> I buy a lot of gear and I spend a lot of money on this stuff and my own money. But one of the things that I just haven't sprung for on the expensive side are C stands. So I own about three C stands and they're all newer C stands, N E E W E R. Um, they might, they may not ship to your country depending on where you live. If you're in America, you can definitely get them. Um, but depending on where you live, you can get them. They're generic. I've had them for, I don't know, three or four years and they still work great. A couple of them, you know, some bolts have gotten loose and I just tighten them back down, but they do fantastic. I'm using one right now to, you know, hold up my camera. I use them for lights. So I highly recommend C stands. Newer is great. Impact makes some cheaper ones um, as well. And then of course you can get the very expensive ones from Matthews and some of the other large brand names, but man, they get expensive. These newer ones, I think were about $125 each. Whereas a Matthews one is more of like the three to $400 range. Um, but they're definitely going to last like decades if you buy one of those. So I'll, uh, uh, that's, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. The, the, the more generic ones though, they're definitely not as high quality as the higher end ones. I've used both the higher end ones. You can tell like, holy cow, these things are beasts. They're heavy. They're really sturdy. This is not going to like ever kind of wear out especially any of the knobs or anything as opposed to some of the generic ones um all right still looking at some questions here okay johnny d says what are the benefits of shooting in 4k 60. okay so i think you're probably referring to the xt4 or maybe the black magic um pocket 6k which 
can basically shoot in 50 frames per second at 6K. Why on earth would you need that much resolution or um, speed? Well, basically it's for slow motion. So I, I don't shoot everything in 60 frames per second or 120 or whatever. I'm not that like slow-mo cinematic b-roll guy like you you see online um i i like some slow motion i think it looks fantastic but it's got to be used you know properly and and used sparingly so 4k 60 i mean everything's going 4k now the beauty of it is of course you can crop in so i i i crop in on 4k images all the time and then deliver in 1080p so the resolution still looks really high excuse me or I'll film in 4K, crop in a little bit, and still deliver in 4K, and the resolution still looks great. So, yeah, 4K 60 is fantastic if you want slow motion. So, in a 24 frames per second timeline, that gives you 40% speed. Or if you do a 30 frames per second timeline, that's going to give you 50% speed. So, yeah, 4K 60 is awesome. Um, it's 4K. Why not? You know, it's beautiful resolution, and if you want slow motion... It's great. So most cameras right now on the market only shoot 4K in 1080p or 30. So doing the 60 frames per second is fantastic. I know cameras like I believe the GH5 does 4K 60. And obviously, like I just said, the Black Magic. But um, it's really nice to have that on the Fujifilm X-T4 if you want to shoot higher res slow motion. All right. Richard says, how do you transport your lights and flags and other grip equipment? Good question. Um, I use a truck. I own a truck and that's how I pretty much get all my gear around. I also have my wife drives and drives a small SUV. And if I put the seats down, my C stands and flags all fit in there. If you are driving a sedan, good luck. You're, you're not going to, you're really not going to be able to get giant four by four flags into the back of a sedan or into the doors. Trust me, I have tried it. It doesn't work out great. You need a little bit of a larger car or a van or whatever it is to transport that kind of equipment or someone on your team that you're shooting with to transport that kind of equipment. Um, if you don't have a larger car or access to a larger vehicle, then I recommend some other workarounds. Don't get, um, flags that have metal frames there are plenty of large pieces of diffusion and flags that break down it just means more work on set you have to put them together and strap you know the cloth onto the front of them but there are a lot of collapsible flags that you can buy so i recommend getting a collapsible one instead if you don't have a large vehicle and then if you don't have a way to transport c stands just get the sturdiest nicest light stands you can instead of a giant c stand so uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of uh, insight to that um, Samuel Naharo Gonzalez. What's up, dude? Um, thanks. Thanks for jumping in there. Um, you say, what's your favorite LEDs to use? It's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I'd say my favorite LEDs to use are the Airy Sky Panels, the S30. That's a fantastic one. Um, it's also $6,000. So <laughs> favorite to use but I don't own it. So we use it in studio all the time. The studio that I work at has six different Airy S30 panel lights. These are the ones that they use on movie sets. Uh, they each cost $6,000. So that's $36,000 just for them. And then the Chimera light boxes you put on them are like 800 bucks, somewhere around there. So very expensive. Those are definitely my favorite to use, uh, but favorite that I own to use. Um, I've been loving all different ones. The I have the Falcon Eyes RGB LED light here, and I've done a whole video on that review. I love it. it. It looks great. It's soft. It's bright, and it's RGB. So when I want bright colors, I can switch into that. These tube lights are LED, and I love them. So far, they're the digital photo um, tube lights, and I did a whole review on them, and they look great. They're not the best for key lights, because their, their CRI or color rendering index isn't the best. It's not the most high quality. But if you want just something for color and you want to add that to your scene, they're fantastic. So favorite LED lights. There's a lot of different LED panels that I like. I'm using the Aperture uh, Mini, 120, or Mini 20D for my hair light. I love that light. Super versatile. If you don't have money for the Aperture 120D, 300D, 300X, any of the other larger Aperture lights, 
their smaller ones are really high quality and do a great job. The, the 120 or the uh, Mini 20D as a hair light. I use it for a lot of other things too. I've used it as a key light before. As long as you get large enough diffusion, it works. I've used it to put slashes on backgrounds because you can barn door it and spotlight it in. So that's one of my favorite lights. But I'd say if you're just getting into LED lights, the Aperture 120D and 300D are probably the way to go. You just have to use light modifiers to make those work because they are a single chip on board, teeny tiny, and that's a hard light source. So make sure you're using a soft box or diffusion with those. But those are probably my favorite for that um, sort of thing. All right, so yeah, if you guys don't have any more questions or, or things on lighting or cameras or whatever, we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up. It's been a lot of fun with you guys. We're, we're an hour and 15 minutes into this. I guess I could stay up all night, but I got to get up in the morning. We got some live streaming to do, a um, couple different videos we're shooting tomorrow. So I got to get to bed soon here, but uh, any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them before I sign off. Okay, Richard says, uh, have you tried the Godox or Nan lights? I have not tried the Nan lights yet, but they're very, very similar to these digital photo ones that I have. They're all coming out of China. They're probably coming out of similar, almost maybe even the same manufacturer. Um, these are cheaper, uh, much, much cheaper. Go watch the video on my channel about these RGB tube lights. It's one of the more recent ones. And they're very similar to the NAN lights in terms of power, brightness, colors, effects, everything like that. So I'd actually recommend these over the NAN lights just because they're cheaper and they do the exact same thing. Pretty much the same quality. They have internal rechargeable batteries in them. And then as far as the Godox lights go, I have used the Godox light once on another shoot with another YouTuber. So he had it. He had it going into a softbox. It worked fantastic. Um, and I, I was pretty impressed with it. It's very similar to the 120D from Aperture. So if you're looking for something more budget, you don't want to spring for the Aperture lights. I haven't bought a 120D yet or 300D yet because they're over $1,000. And that's a lot of money for a light um, when you got to buy a lot of other equipment too. So I definitely think the Godox lights are a great way to go. Um, just make sure you're diffusing or bouncing that light because just anytime you just point a light right at someone, it's not going to look super great. So once you bounce or diffuse a light, it can look fantastic. Just about any light. You can buy really cheap LED lights. I have really, I have some old LED lights, uh, softbox um, you know, panel lights that I own that are newer ones and they're on the cheaper end. But as long as you diffuse it and you know get it looking soft, it looks pretty good. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question there. Um, anyways, other than that, guys, thank you so much for, for hanging out with me. Um, I love all the feedback uh, in, in the comments. Tons of fun. So good time, late night stuff, um, drinking caffeine. I got to go to bed. I'll still probably pass out. But thank you guys for dropping in. Hopefully I answered some questions for you guys on avoiding some lighting mistakes. What are some good lighting techniques that you can have? Um, that sort of thing. So, all right. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm just signing off here, but Sebastian Morales, sorry to answer your question really quick. You're talking about the format high tech holder system. Uh, it's a matte box with ND filters for 150 bucks. I haven't seen that yet. I'll have to check it out and I'll get back to you. I know that Tilta has a really great new map box. It's really small. I think it's pretty cheap. I think it's around a hundred or so dollars. I would recommend checking out the Tilta map box first. More reliable company. There's already a lot of reviews on the new Tilta map box. Go check that one out. It's small. It's really versatile with ND filters and everything. So definitely check that one out um, next. All right, so thank you guys again. Have a good night. See you later. If it's morning or afternoon, wherever you're at, have fun. We will catch you guys in the next video. It's been a great time. See you later. Signing off. Watch my next videos. Make sure you guys are all hitting the bell notification and subscribed. It's been a ton of fun. I will see you guys later on. Have a good night.